<laughs> All right, Alan. Okay. Okay. Super. Thank you. Okay, we'll get started. I think everybody's probably as situated as we're going to be. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Bramley. I'm your city manager. And welcome to the third uh, public input session regarding uh, American Rescue Plan Act expenditures and funding. We call it ARPA, or we call it all sorts of different names. Uh, first of all, masks are certainly not mandatory at all. I went to Indianapolis this weekend and picked up um, uh, a lot of lovely germs for my grandkids. And so since I don't want to spread them to all of you, I'm going to wear the mask and, and less is too, so I don't spread it to him and he has a wonderful holiday. Um, so we're going to, to start off uh, this afternoon with an overview of the American Rescue Plan Act, um, how it's allocated, where it's allocated, what's allocated to the city of Dunedin, um, and how we can best use it to the benefit of those who live and work uh, and play within the city of Dunedin. 
uh, we need your help with that. And so we're going to open it up at the end of this presentation. The presentation is about half an hour long. Uh, and then we're going to go open it up to uh, our public input session. Um, we are Facebook Live today, as we were with the other two uh, of our public input sessions. This one today is uh, geared toward the our not-for-profits, and I see all of you here. It's like a party of old friends, so thank you for coming. And also, we have um, our, our, some of our business community have, have returned, and they're with us today, and our residents as well. Everyone is welcome, and your input is welcome into the uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding expenditures. So uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize our city commission uh, here with us today. Mayor Julie ward Brzezowski in the back, thank you. <laughs> Vice Mayor Jeff Gao. <laughs> Commissioner Deborah Kynes. <laughs> Commissioner Mo Franey. <laughs> and Commissioner John Tornga. So according to our city commission's adopted rules of procedure, this is actually what we call a town hall meeting. And a town hall meeting is convened by the city commission or the city manager in order to get input from the community on a single subject or a few subjects. The city commission today is not, they're not going to be speaking. They are here to listen to you. And um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the program and what we're going to do with the public input sessions and all the information that we gain a little bit later. But, um, but this is a town hall meeting, so uh, we're not going to be able to answer questions. Today is not a question and answer period uh, per se. It's a public input session from all of you. So if there's anything we need to follow up on later, please be sure that uh, you wrote down your email address if you have one, or even a telephone number if you don't, so that we can follow up on some of these meetings with you a little bit later on. But we do have some subject matter experts here today to chat with you a little bit if need be uh, after the meeting. Uh, so we have Les Tyler. He's our director of finance, and he's going to share this presentation with me. Uh, we have Bob Ironsmith, who is our Director of Economic Development and Housing. Uh, we have, have uh, Jorge Quintas, our Deputy City Manager. Uh, we have uh, Vince Gizzi, who is our Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Sue Burness, our Director of Communications. Michael Nagy, uh, who is our Director of IT. And I think that those are our directors present. If I didn't mention you, Director, then put your hand up. Nope. Okay, very good. All right. With that, then we'll carry on. All right. The American, oh, the agenda, we went over that a little bit. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act funding then, $350 billion. On March of 2021, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was signed by President Biden and enacted by Congress to combat the COVID-19 pandemic impacts, including support for business recovery, job losses, and public health. The stimulus package includes $350 million to state and local governments that qualify. So we are pleased to say that the city of Dunedin qualified for American Rescue Plan Act funding to the tune of $18.3 million. Pinellas County then uh, received $189.3 million. And then the this, this cities and the counties altogether uh, uh, received $130 billion. Grant funding was released in two payments. The first was received and placed an interest-bearing account in the city of Dunedin at $9.1 million, and that was October 8th of 2021. And I can tell you, Les got plenty sick of me calling, saying, is it here yet? Is it here yet? <laughs> the second payment is expected in October of 2020. The funds have to be obligated by December 31st of uh, 2024. So for those of you who think that's, that's a long way away, it's not. It's right around the corner. And you think that we are going to be competing um, against our fellow cities and counties and those types of things for resources and personnel. So we are putting together an aggressive program uh, for expenditure predicated upon community input. The um, December 2026 then is a deadline to complete projects funded, complete projects funded by the American Rescue Plan Act funds. We, uh, we have to submit periodic reports uh, uh, detailing the use of the funds. Now, I think that the important thing about those periodic reports and those expenditures too is that the, the county and the larger cities actually received their funding five or six months ago. So unfortunately, we smaller cities uh, are a little bit behind the ball uh, before we even start. So we're trying to catch up a little bit on that. We've been working as city staff uh, with Whit O'Brien, our consultant. Uh, the city commission entered into contract with Whit O'Brien to help us administer this program. We, um, Wood O'Brien is actually working for the county as well, administration of the program. There are six buckets. 
that the federal government had placed the ARPA spending into. The first one is support, um, uh, support public health expenditures. The second one is address negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. The third one is serving the hardest hit communities and families. The fourth one is replace lost public sector revenue. The fifth one is provide premium pay for essential workers. And the sixth one is invest in water and sewer broadband infrastructure. So Les Tyler, our Director of Finance, is going to talk to you a little bit about some of the projects that city staff has identified as eligible for American Rescue Plan Act funding and some that, that could be eligible for, for funding. But the one thing that I want to be very clear about is that at this point, none of this, uh, no project has been delineated or approved apart from the special event funding and revenue recovery, uh, the, the seed money for the special events and revenue recovery as well, right? Les, there's one more. Oh, I'm sorry, in an affordable housing project, which Les will, will describe in a moment. We're waiting for the community input session to put together the program to present to the city commission in late January, and I'll go over that a little bit more in a moment, um, uh, and for the city commission to adopt the program. And so with that, I'm gonna have Les come up to talk to you a little bit about some eligible projects, others that may be eligible, and then we'll open it up for public input. So, Les? Thank you, Jennifer. And again, I'm Les Tyler, the finance director for the city. Happy to be here this afternoon to go over the ARPA information with you. I also want to mention that we have in the very back, far left, uh, Mason uh, uh, Radmaker with Wood O'Brien that uh, Jennifer just mentioned, uh, the consulting firm that's kind of helping us guide us through the uh, ARPA process. Before we get into the, the next slide, I'd like to uh, briefly mention a few things about this grant that, that I consider unique uh, to our city. Uh, this grant is, is unique to me because uh, most federal grants are done where a process where uh, a city or a county applies for a grant and it's normally uh, a competitive process and uh, if, you, if you're awarded a grant, uh, normally it's on a reimbursement basis and uh, you incur the expenditures and you get reimbursed from the federal government anywhere from 30 days to 90 days afterwards. Uh, this grant's unique and the, uh, the Jennifer just mentioned, uh, the money's given to us up front which is, which is different than most federal grants. We've got 9.1 million we received a month ago and we're expecting to get the second 9.1 million about in October of 2022. So that's unique. And also, uh, the other thing about this grant that's unique is when, normally when you apply for a grant, you, you know the specific scope and you know, ex you know pretty much exactly what the grant's for. You fill out an application and you're successful, you're not. With this grant, it's different because we have the money and the, and the federal government, treasury department's telling us Spend the money and make sure you spend it properly. Make sure you spend it on eligible expenditures. So all the onerous is on us to make sure that we, uh, we, we follow the guidelines and we make sure we spend it on eligible activities and we, we don't have any, a situation where if we, if we did not have eligible activities and we had some that they, did, they deemed ineligible, there could be clawback. The federal government could audit, audit us later and, and ask for monies back and things like that. So, we're being very careful to make sure we do our due diligence and we do a really good job working with Little O'Brien to make sure we have, have pinned down what's eligible and what's not as we walk through this process. Uh, a few guiding principles that the U.S. Treasury are recommending that cities and counties uh, consider as they, as they develop their plan for these funds are, one is to be careful to not create new programs or add-ons that require ongoing legacy costs and ongoing operating costs. That's one thing to, uh, to be careful of. Uh, also, they recommend replenishing revenue losses due to COVID-19 for cities and, and local governments to maintain their financial stability and restore their uh, fiscal resiliency. And, this, and the next one is they want you to collaborate with other governments and work together with other governments to try to combine efforts. And as an example of that, we are, are, are working with and be watching, we'll be watching closely what the County of Pinellas does with their funding and see if there's ways that we can provide uh, join efforts and, and possibly work on projects together as we move forward. And the last item they recommend is, is just carefully plan out the projects that you, you want to, or initiatives you want to do with these, with these ARPA funds that we're discussing today, and, uh, and consider, when considering the projects, uh, making sure you're looking at all funding streams that might be available. A good example of that is we just recently had passed the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill just recently, 
And that bill, for instance, includes bridges, roads, mass transit, and broadband uh, as eligible projects. So we'll be working closely with Whit O'Brien, our consultant, and our department heads to, uh, to try to leverage those dollars. And if there's grants out there that we can apply for in the competitive process for, th for some of the projects we deem that, that, that the commission decides to move forward with, that we, we try to leverage those dollars the best we can. I also want to mention that uh, on October 5th, uh, staff presented to the city commission an update of the ARPA funds and sort of where we were at. Uh, staff was at with, the pro with identifying potential projects. That was presented to, to them on October 5th. Uh, much of the information that we discussed with the commission is being discussed today uh, in this presentation. And what I'd like to do now is, is as, as Jennifer mentioned, go through these categories. We've got these six categories and mention a few things that we've done already, the city's done already, and also some things we think that we potentially could do with these funds. So starting with this, uh, the first one is support public health expenditures. Um, in this category, uh, the key points are to respond to COVID-19 and the broader health impacts of COVID-19 when using these funds under this category. The recipient, meaning the city, needs to should identify the need or negative impact of COVID-19 public health emergency and identify how, how the program or service and or, or other intervention addresses the identified need or impact. So things we've done in this category to date would be uh, the city's offered COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine pop-up sites. We had uh, one in March 2021 and another one in, on April 15, 2021. We also had a booster event on October 25th, and another one is scheduled for November 30th uh, from 1.30 to 5.30 at the city's MLK Recreation Center. I, I want to mention the press and flyers in the back of the room if anybody's interested in, in checking out that event on uh, November 30th. Some other examples under this category would be uh, personnel protective equipment and also mental health services. And as far as things that we can do with this funding moving forward, potential would be the fire department, ha uh, its mobile command vehicle replacement uh, would be replacing the that vehicle with updated technology and ensuring safety of personnel. And, and, and that's an eligible project under this category. So that's one being considered. The next category is addressing the negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. And this is in direct response to the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. The ARPA funds can be used by local governments to provide expansive assistance to individuals, households, small business, and impact to communities and industries. Uh, assistance to households that face food, housing, or other financial insecurities. And also key, another key area includes supporting our local travel, tourism, and hospitality industries. Now, things we've done in this category uh, include the city's uh, offered having signing bonuses at a job fair that was done back a few months ago and could possibly do that again moving forward. We've also had uh, have support the local travel, tourism, hospitality, market task force, and the alliance in the city. Uh, we provided special event funding assistance uh, for 22 and 23 for the special events in the city. And also we had the temporary outdoor dining. And some things that we can do in this category there's, there's quite a few projects and initiatives uh, under this category that, that potentially could be under consideration at this time, and those include uh, providing additional commercial facade grants to small businesses citywide. Uh, the next is the, uh, discussions with the, with the Dunedin Chamber of Commerce for business support services or a hub on the second floor of the chamber. Another is uh, Clearwater Ferry Service contributions for expanded service from Dunedin to Clearwater. <coughs> And the next is downtown looper service, and this would be to explore uh, as a people mover, moving people downtown and to address some of the parking and traffic issues we have downtown. Another, another is the Highland uh, Pool Replacement Project. And the last one identified thus far is the Golf Course Capital Improvement Project. The next category is category three, and this is uh, hitting the hardest hit communities and families. Uh, funds can be used to address the disproportionate public health and economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on the hardest hit communities, populations, and households. Under this section, local governments may provide unique support on services within a qualified census tract 
to families and households of geogra or geographical reasons disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Some examples include affordable housing and housing assistance in this. Things we've done, uh, the pop-up vaccine clinics uh, are also eligible in this category, we mentioned that earlier. And things that we can do moving forward would be uh, an affordable workforce housing project that Jennifer mentioned briefly. That's a project that, that, we're, uh, that is eligible, that we're, uh, we're looking into, and we've, we've uh, actually done, done an application. If we're successful with that application through the state, then we would move forward with that. And also another one would be uh, also providing aid to Dunedin Cares is another example. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so the next is replacing lost public sector revenue. Uh, the pandemic hit public sector hard as well as many other businesses and, and entities, as, as you all know. Uh, you know, uh, cities had to slash spending and, and sort of adjust basically to, to, the, to what happened back in uh, March of 2020. Our city is no exception. Uh, just kind of big picture, our general fund, which is it's our main discretionary fund. It's the fund that provides our police services, fire, fire services, our parks and rec, and all of our support departments are covered in that fund. So it's a pretty broad, it's a pretty broad uh, category with really all of our discretionary spending at the, in, the, in the city. And uh, so from, from uh, May, of, excuse me, from March of 2020 through September of 21, uh, that 18 month time frame, our, our reductions in revenue in the general fund were about $2 million in total. They were a combination of sales tax, uh, revenue sharing and different uh, revenues we get from the state and also a lot of <coughs> revenue lost from our program income for uh, for example, Parks and Recs and different departments, uh, program income, they shut down and, and they, they did open back up, but uh, on a partial basis. So we, those revenue streams were hit quite a bit. And as far as the Treasury guidance in this category, uh, there's a formula that's used to calculate the revenue recovery. And it's, uh, it's a mathematical formula that, that looks at 2000, 2019 base year and compares what your actual revenues are in 20 and 21 and future years. And uh, so we've, we, we've done that rough calculation or estimate, I, I guess you'll call it at this point, and we have included revenue recovery dollars in the 22 budget for the general fund, the gas tax fund, our penny fund, and our marina fund at this time. Next category is providing premium pay for essential workers. Uh, this is recognized in the continuous work of essential workers during the pandemic. Uh, these funds can be used for premium pay for directly or through grants to private employers for, for essential workers who were or are physically present at their jobs, including those who, whose work involved protecting the health and well-being of their communities. The city is in the process of develop, developing a program now to recognize essential workers during the pandemic and provide premium pay to these workers. And examples of those would be our uh, water department, sewer department, solid waste department, uh, our examples of employees and others who are deemed essential. We, uh, the fire department did receive some hazard pay from the city back in June of 2020, uh, but these other essential workers in the other departments have not received any hazard or premium pay uh, to date. And the sixth category is water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And this is really the, the, the category for infrastructure and they, they were, and they, they really they kept it pretty pretty narrow with, with water sewer and broadband only, but these funds can be used in a, in a variety of ways for water sewer projects, uh, and they're eligible. And as long as it aligns with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund guidelines or the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund guidelines, they would likely be eligible under this program. And also, broadband investments are eligible in this program uh, with with wireline infrastructure that will provide up to 100 megabytes per second symmetrical standard uh, may be made in areas that are that include underserved or unserved areas uh, and also they recommend that recipients pursue fiber optic investments where possible for stability now things that we can do in this category uh, we have two two potential projects in this category the first is a sewer to septic connection program that we have proposed in the city and the other is uh, a broadband fiber optic project and Wi-Fi project that would be a, a fiber optic, but also uh, having uh, Wi-Fi in parks and many of the public facilities uh, at the city is included in that proposed, proposed project. 
So that includes the six categories that uh, we mentioned. And there are, some, there are some areas that the ARPA are considered ineligible uses of funds, and I just want to point these out. Uh, they are, uh, you, you cannot use the funds to offset tax reductions. If you reduce taxes during that time frame, you, you cannot make it up uh, with these funds, basically. They do not want it to be paid towards pension funds in, in, in any manner. Uh, they don't want it to fund any, current, any debt service of the city. And also, uh, it cannot be used for legal settlements or judgments of any sort. And they also don't want it to be put into any rainy day funds or reserves. Uh, they don't want you to build, build your reserves up. They want you to spend the funding. You can build them back, but they don't want you to build up reserves. They, they want you to spend the money, basically. Um, and community engagement. Uh, this is kind of what we're doing here today. You know, we've got our input session this afternoon. Uh, we also had a, a business input section, a session on November 9th at uh, 9 a.m. that was in the city hall chambers. And we had a resident public input session on November 9th, the same day at 6 p.m. here in, in the library where we're here today. Uh, I also want to mention that we have a survey that will be available soon through a third-party survey company that are, we're currently working with. That survey will be available on our website and accessible through our social media platforms. And for, for next steps moving forward, uh, first thing is community feedback from this input session and, uh, and the other two uh, we just mentioned on November 9th. And then uh, the plan is the first quarter of 22, probably the end of January or early February, uh, staff will, will bring back the ARPA plan and we'll take all the public input from this meeting and the other two meetings and bring that information back uh, to the commission for their input and their direction. And that, and that completes our, our general comments uh, today and I'd like to turn it back over to Jennifer to begin the uh, discussion and answer portion. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Uh, so in order to kind of get, get the juices flowing here and give you a couple ideas before we open up for, the, for uh, public input, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we've heard so far in our first uh, input sessions. And how many of you watched some of them? Okay, just a few of you. All right, so uh, we heard from, from a woman uh, on the resident one last Thursday, Tuesday night that, that she'd like to see some, some um, uh, mobile hotspots for areas that are low to low moderate income to help the students who are, don't have uh, access, the access that they should, especially during a pandemic, but actually typically all the time which I thought was a great idea. We heard from residents that they would like to see a stepped up uh, mental health services for the residents of the city of Dunedin to get us through the next couple of years uh, post pandemic. Uh, we, we heard that, um, that we'd, we need to ensure accessibility for all of our disabled residents and visitors uh, in public places. Uh, we had a really cool idea, which was cooling Main Street, and that is planting more trees and, and um, uh, installing you know, uh, heat reflective surfaces and those types of things. Uh, we heard that, that uh, some of our uh, business owners, small business owners, need additional help uh, and that they need additional support. Uh, and we also heard of a very interesting um, uh, comment from a gentleman. It was actually after a meeting. He didn't want to speak publicly, but he said, whatever you do, Wherever you place this money, make sure it's a seed that's going to grow. They didn't want anything that's going to be the ongoing operation or that type of thing. Make sure it's something that, that you can plant that will multiply upon itself uh, to support the city, our residents, and our businesses. And I thought that was really good advice. I like that. You see, you read in the newspaper that some of, our, um, some of the uh, cities are just putting it in one or two really large projects and calling it a day, which isn't necessarily a very bad you know, approach. But it's a different approach, I think. Uh, and I don't think that those are really predicated a lot of public input, to be honest with you. So uh, we're actually really in, uh, in categories number two and three, which is the, uh, the not-for-profits as well. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the floor. And as I said, there is absolutely no bad idea. Just a couple of things. Now, Antonella, Antonella, wave. She has a microphone. Now, I know that we can probably hear most of you, since I know most of you. And I know that, that you're not, uh, you're not uh, you're shy, but we are Facebook Live, and so we want our audience to hear you. And also, Sue Burness is going to tell us if we have any comments on Facebook, and we'd be happy to address those comments as well. But um, I won't seek those out unless Sue tells me that I need to. So, okay, I know you are not shy, any of you. So hands up, let's, let's hear from you. How can we help you? Okay, first not shy person. 
Hi, my name is Diana Hartman. I've lived in Dunedin in about a couple of years, and I missed the resident meeting, so it's good that I'm first at this meeting. Yes, absolutely. Get the We're glad you're here. Stuff out of the way. Yes. So I was thinking that with the economic downturn and the movement that there's been of people and jobs and whatnot, I would like to see some sort of job training or apprenticeship program because um, everybody going to college is just not working out for a lot of people. So I'd like to see the people who maybe are not planning on going to college develop some kind of skills, maybe tied in with a vocational program in the high schools or something after high school, uh, maybe uh, 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 IT stuff. You can take like a six month, nine month course in IT and come out and know how to do something. Because the problem is a lot of people have no skills, no job skills. So. I'd like to see some job training with this money to get our economy going again. Super, thank you so much. I'm really so impressed with the, the comments that we've heard so far and the quality of those comments and, and you know how far reaching they are. So thank you for that. I think it's a great comment. Uh, Alan had his hand up. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity. I'm Alan McHale. I'm a resident in Dunedin and I'm also president of the Scottish American Society. Uh, the city has a, has a process uh, every year of offering aids to private organizations. And organizations like mine have to list the projects that we want to try and complete. We apply to the city and they give us a portion of that grant back. Uh, for us, we're trying to maintain a 100, almost 100 year old building. There's not anything certain as to whether it's 97 or 100 years. But the floor is, is starting to deteriorate and the bathrooms need to be replaced. But in terms of um, just fixing the floor and fixing the bathrooms, for us it's all about being able to plant that seed that you talked about at the end of your last comment. Because what we have done in the last couple of years is we've returned the use of that hall to the public or to the citizens of Dunedin by presenting um, shows, theater groups, um, concerts and events for other organizations. So the more we can maintain that building and the more we can do to upgrade that building to have proper lighting and sound systems and proper flooring, the more we can return it to the public. And that would certainly help us as a non-profit and your aid to private organizations has gone some way to help that. But uh, if we could make up the difference, it would certainly help us. Okay, thank you. I know that one of the cities, actually, and the mayor had sent us the article, um, did do a, you know, a lump sum to not-for-profits to be disseminated in that, in that fashion. So it was a very interesting program. So they put together a separate program for not-for-profits. I, I thought was, I was intrigued by that program. Thank you, Alan. Joe? Joe, yeah, Antonella will hold it for you because she doesn't want you to get it because you'll never get the microphone back. All right. <laughs> right? <laughs> First, this is weird. It's okay. First, I might. <laughs> no, first, really, I want to thank you, Jennifer and, and Les, and, and the, the commissioners yes. for, you know, having this program to, to give us a, an opportunity to speak our piece. So I'm really grateful for that, and also grateful that you actually mentioned um, Dunning Cares on, on your slide presentation and, you know, the aid to Dunning Cares. We greatly appreciate that. We love everybody equally. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know well, we're not. special. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, go ahead. So, so as you know, um, Jennifer, that uh, Dunning Cares has, has grown significantly. Well, we just completed six years and uh, giving out food to citizens of Dunedin and the surrounding communities. And it seems like we just continue to grow and grow and grow. And we've come to a point now that you're probably aware that we've run out of space again. Matter of fact, we just had to order a pod today to handle more donations that are coming from the schools. So we already have two containers and now another pod. Um, I, don't, I think the church is ready, to <laughs> ready for us to move. So, this is, this is the one thing that I wanted to put out in the forefront, that Dunning Cares needs a larger facility. Um, we're looking very seriously, and anything that the, the city of Dunedin can do to uh, aid us in, in getting a larger facility would be greatly appreciated, not only with the building, but with the finances as well. So, thank you. And you're welcome, Joe. And we have met um, 
regarding facility. And Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about the event that you're about to have too, aren't you? Uh, which one? The Isn't big that one? the casino night? The what? Aren't you? No? Okay, so we had scheduled our first ever um, event called the Bootleggers Ball, a Roaring Twenties Gala, mm -hmm. and it was scheduled for September 25th, and because of this wonderful stuff we have going around here, we postponed it. Okay. So we've rescheduled it. It's um, going to be on January 22nd, which is a Saturday. It'll be at the Dunedin Golf Club. Um, we still have some room. We would love to invite everyone. Tickets are like $100. Um, it's a, it's a dress, dress up. Uh, it's going to be great. A lot of music, a lot of good food, a lot of, a lot of antique cars. And uh, I heard Al Capone might be there, but I'm not real sure. But, but Babe Ruth is a shoe-in. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Okay. Dr. Pat. Oh. Okay, we're going to go around and then come around. Very good. Hello, my name is Roseanne Landreth, and I'm here from the Dunedin Music Society. Hi, Roseanne. We have a request, and I think it would fall under the number two category, um, that we would like to have a music center, and that would reach out to the whole community, our, our, um, our mission is to connect the public with Music, music is definitely um, helps with your mental health and all of that. So um, that's that's what we were asking for, and um, it wouldn't just be a music center. Wouldn't just be for us. It could be for people throughout the community. Okay. So and host, you know, other artists from all around and everything. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pat Snare, and I'm a 63-year resident of uh, Dunedin. And um, I would like, I was only two when we came here. Um, I would like to shirt tail on Alan's talk about uh, the Scottish heritage of our town. We at the Dunedin uh, Scottish Arts Foundation are very fortunate to have coming in the Royal Scottish Pipe Band Association Intercontinental Solo Drumming Championship in February. So our uh, focus would be on travel and tourism because we are actually bringing people into our community from all over the world. I think that uh, with this and the piping college that we're doing and the people coming in for the Highland Games and everything, uh, we do contribute quite a bit to the travel and the tourism of this community and we would like some help with putting these programs on. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Pat. I'm from the Miniature Art Society of Florida representing this society. We hold the largest miniature art exhibition in the world. You will hear others from other countries say that and many of the visitors come in from out of state and out of country every year to see our show. Uh, so we have a big impact. Uh, we support artists from, well, we've had 15, 16 different countries that come, and 33 states usually are represented at our shows. Uh, the impact goes well beyond the society and the artists. Uh, it attracts thousands of visitors to our local museums as well as the wherever our locale is, and this is Dunedin Fine Arts Center uh, this year in January. And the, also we have given scholarships to <coughs> students going into art in colleges. So far, about 134,000. This is our 47th exhibition, and um, the MASF is a bit in jeopardy because last year the show was canceled. This is our only source of income except small amounts of dues for the artists paying for that. We have, in the 47 years, have never asked for funding, so we have managed to go along so far, and we hope to still go on and be around here. I love it when we, at Dunedin and other shows, they leave and they say, Thank you, thank you, this is wonderful, I'll be back next year. These works are for sale and the commission is low to us. 
Um, but it's the local people and others out of state that come because they say we've never seen anything like it and it's very special and art is helping health wise to all of us. So uh, we are very privileged to be here and in the area and get quite a draw and we hope to be able to continue as our 50th anniversary is coming up and we want to celebrate that with all of you. <laughs> Thank you for all of you who know about it and have been there and appreciate it. Works are for sale, but we do not press anybody to buy it. And this year, for the first time, they'll be online. And so, so many of our people just come and see the show and that's what we want you to do. Thank you for your Thank support. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bethany Sullivan. I'm with Feeding Tampa Bay. I'm going to echo a little bit of what Joe said. Um, food insecurity has been become a very prominent issue um, post-COVID. Um, Pre-COVID, it was, um, but it's just become you know, kind of in the limelight lately. Um, Feeding Tampa Bay is actually the largest um, food relief organization in the Tampa Bay area. We service all 10 counties, including Pinellas County. Um, our second largest one. We partner with over 450 agency partners in the area to provi excuse me, provide food for them to then distribute, um, in addition to our own distributions, um, 62 of which are here in Pinellas County, um, 38 of which are in northern Pinellas County, including Harriet's Food Pantry right here in Dunedin. So um, there's a lot of need. Um, Pre-COVID, we were servicing over 600,000 people. Um, and then at the peak of COVID, 1.7 million of our neighbors in need. Um, we're still servicing over 1 million neighbors. We served um, 95 million meals this past year. Our current facility um, uh, was, was originally designed to serve 20 million meals per year back in 2008. And so we're kind of busting at the seams. We have a goal of a hunger-free Tampa Bay by 2025. And in order to do that, we need a facility for, to um, provide um, uh, to distribute 145 million meals um, throughout the community. So we're kind of in the process of, of um, working on funding for a new building ourselves. Okay. Um, and would love, um, much like Hillsborough County, Pinellas County are all coming on board, we would love the, t the surrounding um, communities to also um, assist with that. So, thank you. All right, busting at the seams like the needing yeah. cares. Huh? Okay. Thank you. All right. My name's, excuse me. My name's Alan Mortimer. Uh, my wife, Dolores Mortimer, is the founder and director of the nonprofit House of Mercy and Encouragement that does mental health counseling in the area. And I think um, she's someone who has a lot of experience and knowledge about what the mental health needs are in the community. So I think people like her and probably other people would be good resources as you develop what uh, plans and what programs you're going to do with mental health. I know a lot of times it's tempting to get a large organization and give them a lot of money for mental health, but I think there's a lot of small organizations like hers that could really provide services and like I, my initial idea too was just provide input into what could be done with the money. Very good. Thank you, Alan. It's a, it's a wonderful program you have going. Thank you. Antonella can't run fast enough. Hello, um, I'm Jeanette Donahue. Hi, Jeanette. Long, long resident, lifetime resident, Dunedin, and I also work in Dunedin all my life. So um, I'm with Random Acts of Flowers, and as you guys know, we repurpose and bring flowers to those in nursing homes, hospice care, and nursing facilities. And um, we're going on our eighth year at this month, and we've serviced 120,000 um, individuals at this point in time. And we are also, um, with our loss of fundraising that we have had over the last two years, our goals that we had have kind of been pushed to the side. So we're just, just trying, as everybody else, to stay open and stay afloat with, um, you know, we, we both took, we only have two employees, we both took um, a pay cut to stay in business, <laughs> as well as, um, again, what our goals are. So for us, it's um, really, what we do is we deliver. So having a van, we have had a van for eight years. It was already a used van. So something like that would be really helpful for us to keep our business going because that was our five-year plan, um, which would have been last year, to try to um, gain money to get a new van and to service more in our area. So um, that would be my input. Very good. Thank you, Jeanette. 
Hi, I'm David Lamaca. I'm the Executive Director of Neighborly Care Network. Uh, Neighborly provided uh, this past year over a half a million dollars of home delivered meals, uh, uh, transportation to dining facilities and, and physician's appointment and pharmacy runs. Uh, we also operate a daycare up the road in, in Palm <coughs> Harbor where a number of uh, Dunedin residents um, are there, um, on a, on a, uh, folks with dementia, uh, cognitive disorders are at our programming. Um, Neighborly never stopped. The day the pandemic hit, when we talk about essential workers, we couldn't stop delivering home delivered meals. We couldn't stop picking up people and taking them to medical appointments. So we never missed a beat. Um, unfortunately, our funding did. And so when, when we talk about revenue replacement, one of the challenges we saw is this, this past year, we're going to lose close to $900,000. Um, and so we're really working hard to try to backfill a little bit of that, but also moving forward. We have to be creative as to how do we keep doing that stuff when we're being mandated to pay a dollar an hour more per employee, where we're being mandated to pay yeah, double gas prices, while food costs, we all know what food costs are. Mm -hmm. They're the same things for us in the meals we deliver. Our food vendors are already asking for 10% more, and we spent almost $3 million on food last year alone. And we have to purchase that. That's not, that's not commodity, or it's not food that we still work with all the food banks to deliver meals, uh, to deliver groceries but we're still delivering hot delivered meals. And again, remember with Neighborly and Meals on Wheels, it's more than a meal. It's the daily check-in on people. Some we might be the only person they see. So we're looking at, at, at any ways we can um, kind of uh, make, a, make a change with that. Uh, we're active with the Dunedin Committee on Aging, uh, attend all their meetings and try to be in their planning sessions and try to, try to resolve any issues they have, especially transportation, getting seniors around, around town. We have a, a number of vehicles buzzing through Dunedin every single day. So mm -hmm. we'd, be hope, we'd be happy to be, uh, uh, be considered for, for some opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Right. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Hi, I'm Heather uh, Miniello, a resident of Dunedin and recent founder of Hope Grove Coworking Care. It is a co-working space focused on mental health support for the whole community. I provide childcare at the space as well with certified teachers. And then in the main co-working space, we host support groups, workshops, and education to small businesses and families and anybody struggling with any mental health issue. I uh, reach out to local therapists and I would love to talk with Dolores as well. Um, I used to take my stepdaughter to House of Mercy and Encouragement. It was a huge help to her. Um, when the world shut down, I saw a huge need for mental health and community collaboration and connection. Um, as a small business owner for years myself, um, I really needed that human connection. I thrive with you know, building relationships and uh, being out and active in my community. Um, so I opened this at First United Methodist on uh, 421 Main Street. Is that the church in the space where Head Start was for the last 15 or so years? Um, so we have the whole outdoor space and about 2,000 square feet inside. Um, I did the whole build out and funded this project myself. Um, so I had, you know, a little bit of savings and I put it all into this because I believe passionately in it and uh, I'm looking to collaborate and uh, support all of you guys in any way I can. If I can host events or workshops or bring in professionals that want to give back to the community, I would love to do that with you. And uh, I've even reached out to the chamber and offered to host any larger events that they can't fit there because I have enough space for about 35 to 45 people. And then I have a huge outdoor space as well. So any um, way that you guys could support me with uh, getting set programs, professionals in there, leading mental health support groups, workshops for small business owners on how to get started in the small business um, world, like how to find, even how to um, like uh, do your LLC, how to do your taxes, like all of the basic stuff that new young business owners don't know, or how to uh, set up payroll, those kind of stuff things is what I, I see a need for in our community, a lot more education in the back end. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. So one of the things that uh, Les and I were talking about as Antonella walks over is that um, the federal government actually gave a little bit on the, uh, the requirements as far as, as um, the agreements they had to enter into. And it used to be a 17-page agreement, and now it's a couple pages. It's not a subrecipient agreement anymore, which is a very onerous process. So they made it a little bit easier. And that's, we heard about that this morning, and that's really good news for everybody. Go ahead, Blair. How are you, Blair? Hi. I don't know if I'm supposed to look that way or that way. Whichever way you want to look. Okay. Anyway, it's okay. Just look up here. here. 
Uh, my name is Blair Cooey, and I'm with the uh, Dunedin History Museum. And uh, I actually was going to ask a question about uh, information. Where does one find this, like the PPP loan, uh, mm -hmm. to really get a, a lot of information? I, I like to look things visually. But okay, having, so Blair, if I can yeah. just interrupt. Um, so actually, that that's a really really good point. I mean, all of this funding is coming through local governments. So it, it, you know you uh, you're more than welcome to educate yourself on it, and we can make available whatever information that we have, uh, and and provide you with a link for where we get our information. Okay. Uh, but also, I just want to take one minute to say, um, y you know, the museum also uh, we we try to enrich community pride. By, by getting history out there. We just had a great event um, called The Last Hurrah at the Kellogg Mansion, and the new owners, Dave and Chrissy Wenk, are donating all proceeds from that event and auction proceeds, uh, minus the Auctioneers Commission. And the, the John Robinson came up with a great idea <coughs> to provide a year membership for anyone who bought a ticket. So we, we got quite a few more members. Uh, let me just say, Vinny right now is giving a tour of the mansion, but he, he is so responsible. I think we came in second place for uh, small, small to medium-sized museums in the latest uh, statewide uh, uh, survey poll, however you want to say, with like a 94.6 rating. And that isn't done just, you know, overnight. But also, uh, Jeanette there, thank you for uh, the Random Act of Flowers being a, a sponsor of the event, Deborah and Alan Kynes. We're, I, I'm sorry, if I'm trying to see if there's anybody else that uh, was a sponsor, but thank you so much. And just, you know, get the word out. We're, we, we only have around 1.5% of people in Dunedin who are members. That is going up now because of what happened at the, at the event. But um, I encourage you to come. And, and we're trying to give as much as we can back. So thank you very much. Thank you, Blair. Anybody else? Rod Coleman in the back. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Rod Coleman. I'm encouraged uh, by the comments today because I think uh, a lot of what we're hearing is quality of life. And here in uh, Dunedin, that's very important. I. Uh, have a couple of hats I'd like to uh, tip today. Uh, of, I founded the uh, Youth Sailing Association uh, for youth in uh, about 12 years ago and still a current board member. And uh, we're using a lot of the same equipment that we started with. And something like that, I think, uh, fits into the quality of life. The other one is I'd like to Shout out to uh, Dunedin Fine Arts Center for their contribution as well in the community. And, and I know they have growth needs as well. The third thing I'd like to say is uh, I hope that we can partner up with the county and possibly Habitat for Humanity to look real hard at housing, affordable housing for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. We, um, Jack, so, so, you know, as far as partnering up with the county, that's a very good point, Rod. Uh, they're $189 million. As I said, they are, they are working on larger scale projects, but they have committed to approaching the cities to talk about what partnerships that, 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 we, can, that we can develop in order to expend some of their funding as well. Hey, Jack. Hello. Uh, my name is Jack Batesall. I'm the president for the Downtown Dunedin Merchants Association. Um, I think that uh, I, there, there's two different types of non-for-profits, just so everyone knows. We, there's non-for-profits that do charity work, and then there's membership non-for-profits. So the Downtown Dunedin Merchants Association is a membership non-for-profit, which I spoke more at the business uh, hmm. one the other day. Right. Um, so I'm just going to add some comments on, on top of that uh, to go more towards the, the charity side. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we can look into as a city is uh, we've heard a lot of the non-for-profits today speak up and, and say that they handle different types of programs. Um, maybe there should be a study done uh, to, to look into what programs are missing from the city. Um, you know, what, where is the need in the low income housing sector or the, uh, any, any type of sectors around, whether it's mental health, everything that was kind of mentioned today, and see if there is a gap that we are missing that we could put this type of funds to, 
to start a program um, or to add on to a, a non-for-profit that's already here to add on to the programs that they already have. So uh, whatever that might be, music, arts, uh, mental health care, uh, anything like that. Um, but I think that would be a great, a great addition to that. Um, I think the, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, I think that was kind of my main gist of the whole thing. I, I, I think that, you know, there are some, there's some in here that I've been around for many years and didn't even know that there was some of those around here. And I think some of us are probably saying the same thing in the room. So yep. uh, some type of a study to, to get that stuff put, brought forward. So okay. thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eleanor Fox. I'm representing the Kiwanis Club of Dunedin. And I want to thank the city for including us in the, uh, the program for nonprofits. And I especially like to thank Les for helping me with this, this uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's uh, some kind of an application for government help. And I still need help. But anyway, I just want to show my appreciation to the city of Dunedin for uh, opening their arms to us. Thank, thank you, you, Eleanor. Well, you're, you're our favorite people, but you know. Our not-for-profits, members and public benefit. Okay. Oh, got a hand up. Any? Oh, that's Sue. Oh, that's. <laughs> I'm like Sue. What are you doing? <laughs> no, I, I'm going to read a uh, a okay. comment. Okay. Um, from Facebook. All right. So this is from Margaret Majeski. My name is Margaret Majeski. I am one of 11 artists at Sterling Art Studios and Gallery, which is a nonprofit organization in downtown Dunedin. Our mission at Sterling is to bring art to artists at all places in their artistic journey. We propose offering art to the public by securing funding to provide free art workshops at Sterling, including supplies and materials, as well as pay for our instructors to be held at our nonprofit. Art is a way to express oneself. It brings calm as well as peace to our lives, all which helps our mental health. Very good, thank you. Okay, one comment on Facebook. Okay. Uh, Okay, Jack's coming back around. Jackie, did you have something? Okay. Well, let's let Jack, and then we're gonna bring you the microphone. So, so I'm sorry. Able to hear I know. You. I know Vince just left. If you can still hear me out there or not, but um, I, I think one of the programs that we are missing that would be kind of with the health of the city is more pickleball courts, um, outdoor pickleball courts. Um, I know it's, it sounds kind of different, but uh, Clearwater and other cities have some amazing pickleball facilities, and I think that that is a new thing that some. Older, the older folks are attaching on to, to to stay healthy. So pickleball courts is definitely some green space usage that could be used. Thank Very you. good, thank you. Pickleball is hot. It really is. Yeah, okay, and Jackie and over here in, in pink. Okay, who's after Jackie? Hands up and we'll... Nobody yet, okay. Good afternoon. Jackie Niagro. Can we, can we, me. I can't hear Jackie. Thank you. Go ahead. Jackie Niagro. I live at Nine Hague Place, which is Honeymoon Island, and I've been here for 16, no, sorry, 17 years. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Arts and Culture Committee, uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, we have been approached many times uh, by various members uh, of the community. Um, and they are looking for a public, not belonging to any private com uh, community, but a public theater for the city of Dunedin. Now, we're not looking to build one today or tomorrow, but what we would like to have is the money to fund a feasibility study whether or not it would work within the city. We are arts and culture, and as you know, we have culture everywhere, sorry, art everywhere, and we do have the music of uh, the Scottish uh, group and dancers, Pat. And, <laughs> and the lady said um, that she needed a music center and someone said they needed an art show. Well, such a venue would allow for all of that to happen. Um, we've had former commissioners uh, supported uh, a theater. We have current commissioners that also support it. 
Um, residents and business owners have also approached us, and the CRAC and the DDMA members have also spoken of and support this venture. The Arts and Culture Co uh, Advisory Committee has already received seven city cultural organizations' letters of support for a city public theater, and some of them are here today. Um, a private commercial venture of professional theater facility would, firstly, offer a venue for a variety of stage entertainment, drama, choral, quartets, readings, lectures, music, excuse me, musicals, dance, art shows even. Secondly, it would be an economic driver, creating and supporting jobs, generating government revenue, and serving as a cornerstone of our arts tourist industry, which is quite, quite large, as you know. And lastly, a theater would satisfy the increasing desires of our visitors, which would then put Dunedin on an even more attractive level for them, and further elevate Dunedin as an arts destination and an even deeper enhancement of our epic goal number one, which is to create a vibrant cultural experience that touches the lives of our community and visitors. Tourists, we find, are increasingly wanting a deep, authentic experience which all of the arts venues can provide. The Arts and Culture Advisory Committee understands that it would be a two-part venture in achieving the goal of such a theater facility. First, we would have to conduct a citywide city -wide feasibility study to gauge the support for a, the a theater at which, <coughs> excuse me, known professional entities would perform, and secondly, form a business plan based upon the study's findings. So today, our Arts and Culture Advisory Committee joins the chorus of citizens in asking for commission support in this very simple first step of investigating the feasibility of a public theater for our city. We have a, just, we have a figure sort of but I won't speak up now about it, but it's well under 15,000. Okay, thank you, Jackie. It's such a shame you weren't prepared for this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, Jackie's always prepared for these meetings, so thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much, yes. That was excellent. We knew that we'd hear from George Ann. We knew that that was going to happen. <laughs> Hello, George Ann Bissett. Well, I don't know what to say because I've enjoyed everyone's infomercials uh, about all the things that you do. But one thing I do know, since I know almost everyone in this room, is all not for profits as well as cities lost a great deal of money during the pandemic. There can't be one organization that has not lost. We lost between 600000 and a million dollars. But I do know that Dunedin, um, and I'm very happy that I live here over in Waybridge Woods, the Dunedin population, the residents and the not-for-profits and the cities, we all love activity, arts, and music. And, you know, we're prepared to work with everyone bearing in mind that we have suffered just as much, even though some people think that we're like a money pot, but we're not. It's, it's because we have wonderful people in this community. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, George Ann. I really feel like we should have celebrated this meeting a little more because having all of you in the room together is really something. It really is. <laughs> Sorry, can That's I just right. add one more thing? Um, yeah, in addition to food relief, and many of you might not know, but food, um, Kingston Bay also, um, we talk about, you mentioned um, you know, job training and that kind of thing, and that is one thing that we actually have a program for, Fresh Force, where we offer um, CDL licenses, um, culinary arts, as well as um, op uh, warehouse operations. We're looking mm -hmm. to expand that program as well, so that's part of it. And we also just opened our first um, 
empowerment center where we, where we com, um, offer a food pantry in addition to hot meal service, but then we also partner with other organizations around the community to lift up our neighbors in need, um, whether that's health services or education. Um, we just opened our first empowerment center here in Pinellas County in St. Petersburg. So that's an additional resource to um, help our neighbors here in, in Pinellas County and Dunedin. Um, and so just wanted to offer that um, information as well, our Feeding Pinellas branch. Very good, thank you, Bethany. All right, anybody else for the group? Very, very interesting meeting. All right, so, so next steps then moving forward, and I wanna go over this one more time, um, just so, so everybody here and everybody watching knows exactly, you know, because this is going to be obviously a very large program. I mean, it, you know, that we're going to put before the city commission, we're going to call a special city commission meeting. It's probably gonna last most of the day because there's going to be a lot to get through for the city commission. The, uh, we need to meet uh, individually now with our five commissioners um, to go over this public input session to talk to them about you know, where they are with, with the American Rescue Plan Act funding, uh, put together a program from now through the end of, of January. And again, as I said, to put it before the city commission. Uh, we uh, staff at the city of Dunedin, we've officially canceled Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we're just gonna be working right through and they're all fine with that, aren't you? <laughs> No, no, we, we won't be doing that. We won't be doing that. I won't be there. Okay, oh, the mayor won't be there, so I guess we can't do that then. Uh, but that said, it, it's really, I mean, the responsibility to the community to, to ensure that the expenditure supports all of you and is of benefit to the community uh, weighs very heavily on all of us, obviously. So this is just the first step in the public input um, portion of our program. We're going to keep you uh, in, the, in, the, in the inner circle, if you will, all of those who attended these meetings via the email, and, and Sue Burness is our, is our relatively new director of communications. We'll be sending you emails about meetings and when the next meetings are, and when we put the program itself together. We're not going to be able to, everything, to address everything that you, everybody's asked for. We're, we're just obviously not, but we're going to do our best, as I said, to put a program before the city commission that is of the most benefit to the city of Dunedin. So, did you have one comment, sir? Oh, I may I? I actually like to hold my own microphone. Uh, there's a wonderful expression about putting all your bags into one basket. Evidently, we may not be able to do that, uh, but I would like to work with those who like the idea of trying to bootstrap a better quality of life for the city here and proceed to use this gift, and it is a potential gift, uh, for the most effective purposes. A very famous and wonderful man once said, the poor you will always have with you. There are ways to make the most of this gift, and it is not necessarily looking back to find the answers that we're looking for. Uh, I love this town. I love the people in this town. They are very charitable and kind and loving, but we have far more resources here in the people and in the, the nature and the water and everything we have. We are truly blessed, but we need to pay better attention to what we already have and make the most of it. Okay, thank you, David. And with that, we'll let you have the last word. And they were beautiful words, so, all right. Thank you all so very much for coming. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. currently looks like I highlighted the area in yellow where the uh, sidewalk should be um, so you can see all the adjacent properties along with the Pinellas Trail to the east from the street view on the south elevation uh, you can see the existing state of the thriving live oak trees 
And you can see that looking east. You can see the live oak trees from there as well. Um, this is the boundary survey that was originally provided in the initial design review of Mira Vista Phase 2. You can see that um, the live oak trees from the tree inventory and the boundary survey, you know it's kind of hard to tell, but it'll be obviously the large diameter circles. That's going to be um, tree number two and tree number three for the tree rating guidelines that you'll see on the next slide. Per the City Arborist review of Mira Vista Phase 2, the parcel approximately has six mature large diameter trees that would need to be removed in order to accommodate the design of a sidewalk of the southernmost end of the parcel, one of which is a grand live oak tree. Staff has consulted with the City Arborist, who is in favor of granting or approving a variance to remove the sidewalk on Wilson Street. Any additional root damage could be extremely detrimental to the health and the stability of these trees. Uh, additionally, I just wanted to state the uh, proposed comprehensive plan update reinforces the city arborist comment about the importance of tree preservation. Per objective 3.4 of the proposed comprehensive plan update, uh, we must enforce the minimum open space tree protection standards of the, land, of the land development code in order to promote the preservation of existing tree canopies. The expansion of tree canopies and the overall quality of the development within the city for all development or redevelopment initiatives. And then, like I stated with the um, slide beforehand, you see um, tree number two and tree number three. You can see the, um, the condition rating that they're in. Obviously, Craig Wilson can speak to that. Um, and then this is the street network. So um, this, this slide features the existing street networks, including Bayshore Boulevard, which is considered a major roadway. The public sidewalk system will still exist on the westernmost part of the parcel to maintain the connection to adjacent properties while still maintaining the crosswalk connection to the east from the Pinellas Trail to ensure public safety. Additionally, we have the assistant public works director in attendance, Russell Ferlita who is speaking on behalf of the engineering division. He will be able to address any concerns related to public safety and uh, neighboring circulation. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that the approval criteria of section 104-22.7 of the land development code um, has unique and relevant environmental conditions uh, that is specific to the property. Uh, staff finds that the petition meets the requirements for variance approval, as noted in uh, Section 5 of the analysis from the staffing report. Therefore, staff recommendation is to approve the variance application BAA 21-3B. Any questions? I, I do have a question. I'm, sure. So what, what is prompting the request for the variance? Um, these, so these trees have obviously been there for a really long time. So there is a infrastructure standard in the land development code that states that there is a minimum of a five foot wide sidewalk that has to be placed for any type of development or redevelopment. So if a sidewalk were to be placed on Wilson Street with the two existing live oak trees, it could potentially damage them later on. So. So there's a potential for a redevelopment, or there is a plan currently for redevelopment? Mira Vista there? Phase 2. Yeah, that's yes. what I was asking. Yep. Okay. I have a question. I think it's relative to the city arborist, though. So. Sure. Okay. Hello. Uh, it appears that the proposed development is actually uh, proposing, I'm assuming, asphalt and curbing uh, to the north of the existing trees. And it looks like the existing paving is actually going to be extended further south, which would actually put it closer to the trees. Uh, in your opinion, is the proposed development going to uh, negatively impact the trees in the critical root zones? If, it, if they do, it'll be limited. Basically, the surface that's just north of that green space that exists now is impervious it's asphalt they would be encroaching slightly into that green space but i've worked with the projects consulting arborists to design or, or 
they're designing a tree preservation plan and a grading plan to where the um, asphalt would be pulled off, the grass would be skimmed, and then any um, existing driveway or pervious pavement type system would be installed on grade as to not dig into the um, existing green grass weedy area. So everything would be above grade and be porous. Um, so yeah, that would encroach a little bit further south than the asphalt is now, but um, not much. So. Okay. And then I assume from this, uh, this plan that it's really just graphical for all the water service lines to the buildings um, you know, being spaced out. I assume that they can be clustered and pushed further to the north to, again, stay out of that root zone. Obviously, those need to be underground and would affect the roots. Originally, they were very close to these trees, and I, during design review, I, I pointed out that that wouldn't be allowed, and they needed to reroute their stormwater, sewer, pot potable water lines, and um, kind of reconfigure everything to save these those three trees along that site. And um, to my knowledge, that's the intention moving forward. So yeah, a lot of the heavy utilities and the deep digging and trench box type stuff is going to be outside of you know the critical root zone of that tree. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. It, to your knowledge, is that actually true? I mean, you said to your knowledge, but is it actually is it actually? Well, they haven't they haven't submitted a, a revised plan yet, so I haven't seen that revised plan. But on the last plan that they submitted, they did all that. Does anyone else know, or is that? I mean, I think that's their intention. <laughs> They're going to get resistance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But on the last plan submittal, that was the case. They moved all the utilities outside of the critical root zone of those trees. Mm -hmm. okay. is, is there anything else that you see um, about the plan project that would be detrimental to the trees or in, in any other way of concern to an arborist? No, and I wanted to correct Molly. I think she said six trees. It's actually three. Um, mature live oaks directly along kind of the right of way essentially of, of Wilson. Um, and one of them is an offsite tree along Pinellas County Trail. That tree has a, a, that tree has a severe undulation to it. And in order to put a sidewalk in there, I'm not even sure logistically how you do that with slope and pitch and all that. So there, there's that tree and then you progress down to the entrance that currently exists. And there's another large live oak tree right there I think, in my professional opinion, that this tree would actually benefit because they are removing asphalt, extending green space, and relocating the entrance, the throat, the ingress, egress entrance, further away from the middle tree and adding a little more green space to the west of that tree. And then as you go to the large grand live oak that's furthest west, that also has a bunch of mounding and undulation going up from curb line to the tree. So if you were to, even if you were to install a sidewalk on grade out near the curb, it would be like a, a crazy wall with railing, and I just don't see how you'd do that. Plus, however old the tree is, let's just say 7,500 years old, there's so much of the roots that are mounding up in that area because they were growing, you know, towards infrastructure and towards curbing that they're continually mounding and building in that area, so they need any break they can possibly get you know that side of the tree is critical for it to be untouched in my opinion um not to mention future damage if we just put a sidewalk there you know in 10 15 years i feel like we would be repairing the sidewalk and in order to repair the sidewalk we would be damaging the roots that have grown between the time the sidewalk is installed until now um and, and that's kind of my perspective on it okay thanks Any other questions for the city? I have one question. If these weren't oak trees, would we be having this discussion? If they were a different kind of tree? Most likely, yeah. And what kind of upticks it too, though, is this, the size and the stature. You know, they're, they're older trees. They're, um, you know, iconic in, the, in that area and on that street. They're historic trees. So we always have an extra level of, of protection for historic and grand trees. And that's what you have in this case. You know, if you have smaller diameter trees that could be replicated, you know, elsewhere on a project, you probably wouldn't get as much resistance. But um, that's not the case here. So. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward and provide their presentation? Please give your name and address. Yeah. Thank you. Doug Anderson. I live at 1413 Bayshore Drive. And thank you all for allowing us to, to come and speak with you today. When, we, when I purchased that property, the design that we came together with, I never intended for those trees to go away because they add so much to the, the feel of, of the property. So as we went through the design process and, and we progressed through LPA and through both readings of the city commission to get the development order, those trees were mentioned probably no less than 10 or 15 times by both the LPA board and the city commission in asking me to do everything I could to preserve those trees because everyone wanted them to live. So in the process of development, we hired a tree preservation arborist who worked closely with Craig. We met on site probably four or five times all together, and we looked at what we thought would be the best way to give those trees the best chance to survive. The sidewalk um, would, have, would have harmed the root system uh, to, to a point, and I'm not an arborist, but I'm, taking, I'm, I'm listening to what the experts say, would have over time made the likelihood of those trees not surviving much higher than if we did not disturb that area today. Um, there is a sidewalk along Wilson on the other side of the street that does connect with the sidewalk in Bayshore that does connect with the sidewalk by um, the uh, VFW. So it's, uh, it's an area that already has sidewalks and that, that's the story behind it. We just want to do everything we could to save those trees and that's why we've asked for this variance in conjunction with the city staff. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? Would you consider a condition of a variance to, should the trees uh, perish within a certain number of years to then go back and install sidewalk? Sure, if, uh, if, that's what the, if that's what the city and the arborists wanted to do, of course. Yeah, we're not, we're not trying to get out of spending money on the sidewalk. That, that's not the intent here. The intent here is to preserve the trees. And again, we're responding to the tree preservation arborist we have retained and Craig. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Uh, anyone from the audience, the public, that would like to um, present or ask questions? Very good. Thank you very much. We we'll close the public hearing. Um, and so, is there any commentary or questions from the board? with regard to the application. I'd like to suggest a condition, uh, should the board move to uh, vote to approve the variance, that uh, the applicant bond for the installation of the sidewalk for a period of two years, five years, whatever. Um, that way, should, should construction on site uh, further damage or, or impair the trees and they were to perish, then that the sidewalk would be constructed after the fact. Is that a motion? If I'm allowed to make a motion, this is my first day, so. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, you are allowed to make a motion. If you'd like, you can. Yeah, you can. Okay. I'd like to make a motion for approval with conditions. Uh, excuse me? Just I would need clarification on that um, condition because it was not. Right, he's going to give it again. I, I have, a, I have okay. a staff question sort of related to that. Do you mind if I go ahead and ask that? Please. Um, I'm unclear as to what that means, <laughs> what he's suggesting. Um, is someone in a position to answer that question? So, so and, and is it even necessary? I mean, is it, it, it may be that concern may be taken care of uh, by your process, your normal process. I'm just not sure. So, um, I, I think it's a reasonable condition, and certainly if the developers agree to it. So, um, my my thought would be that we do have a mechanism in place through our engineering division to allow a, um, uh, some type of performance bond uh, for a period of time, whatever the board agrees to, and then we could ask them to put a value on that. Their engineer of record could do that, a probable opinion of cost for that sidewalk, um, and with the commitment that should the trees, uh, 
the construction on the, de the development of the site, should that lead to the demise of the trees, then they would have to install uh, within that period of time, is what I'm hearing. If that's the case, I think we can do that working with our, our engineering folks to make sure that's accomplished, if that's what the board agrees as a condition of approval. I don't think we want to tie it to causation. I think we just want to tie it to a frame of, of, of right. period of time. Uh, theoretically, I think, is yeah. though, that the construction on site would probably would do what would lead. That's what I was suggesting. That yeah. There, I wouldn't yeah. want us to, right. I wouldn't it's want a, the city to have part. to prove causation. Um, right. that, that would be extraordinarily difficult, I'm yes. sure. Understood. Yeah, I think we can, we can handle that if that's a condition yeah. of approval okay. pretty easily. Okay, good. I just want to make sure we weren't imposing something that's wild and crazy and that you guys say is, you know, not practical. Okay. Thank you. Good suggestion. So I guess I'm going to... For the first day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I guess I'm going to recommend uh, approval uh, with conditions that a bond be placed uh, for the value of the sidewalk to be installed at a future date uh, for a period of five years. Should the uh, live oak or the, the trees along the right-of-way uh, perish for any reason, then the developer uh, would have either the developer or the city can call on the bond to come back and install the, the sidewalk at a, at a future time. Does that contain enough detail for our purposes? Rebecca, you got that? Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion is approved, or the application is approved. Thank you. That concludes our um, open meeting. At this point in time, I'd like the board to uh, contemplate uh, consideration of uh, placing um, vacant board members to the position. Do we all have to fill this out? I can't remember. No, we don't have to fill it out. It's just a... Gotcha. I can wipe that out. Uh, do we each have a copy of the list of applicants? And uh, Deborah, let me clarify that the question from the commission was uh, if, in fact, we feel as strongly that Sherry should be the appointee, that we justify the appointment because we have other applicants who are have been on the list for longer. So they want reasons. Yes, and we have we have a um, open position, which is a permanent position, and we have two alternates that we have to um, identify okay. or vote on. Okay. okay. So Sherry is definitely going to be resubmitted to the commission. If we would like to submit Sherry to the um, to be submitted uh, to the commission, by all means, we just please provide a justification for her, um, as opposed to the others. Is she the individual that was the attorney? No, okay. she's not an attorney. And again, if I can clarify, to you. please. Um, it's just when you look at the dates, it's not that they're saying that they just wanted to make sure that everybody was truly um, looked at. Considered. And, and then if we just give a couple of justifications, just so during the commission meeting, if I were to be asked um, as the clerk, I would be able to um, just let them know that this is how they came to that conclusion. So again, it wasn't that there was anything. It was just strictly mm -hmm. just a, a little more clarification. Just want to make sure we didn't get stuck on the first one. And look <laughs> yeah, never looked yeah. right. <laughs> right. Uh, the other thing I'd like to quantify is those that have applied in 2019. Are, do we know that everyone on this list is still willing and interested? Um, I can, if you choose one, I, I'm more than happy to look at. And okay. I may have already... Um, I, I do tend to reach out quite regularly, as you know, actually. Yes. Because <laughs> we just talked. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't want to say for sure that these ones have, but I would definitely, um, before I took them to commission, okay. confirm that they were still interested um, okay. and let you know if that's not the case at the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Um, from my perspective, I think I, I um, expressed this two meetings ago, maybe, whenever we mm -hmm. considered this last. Um, I, I think it's important that we have a variety of uh, persons uh, who have 
different experience. We have persons who have a variety of experiences and capabilities on the board. I think it gives the board strength and uh, breadth in their um, decision making. So. Um, and in their analysis. So that was my thinking when it came to um, uh, to Sherry, or that is my thinking when it comes to Sherry, and I think we talked about that last time. She has a project management um, uh, perspective, which I think is important. She has, you know, special interests in conservation and environmental protection. We see today, you know, how important that perspective is, and um, I'm just thinking of some, someone who can bring a a uh, different set of skills to the mix. I'd second that. I'd also like to point out that she's actually on four, I guess, existing boards or other committees within the city as well. So she's clearly engaged and looking out for the best interests of the city already. Thank you. So would we consider um, Sherry for the um, a permanent position or an alternative? Are we supposed to decide that or are we just giving names? Does anybody um, know? I would prefer that you, um, because you do have the separation, so I would prefer that you did choose um, the most qualified to probably be, to be the regular member, mm -hmm. and then, um, I don't the most qualified, but you know, yes. go ahead and choose. <laughs> Thank you. We'll give them our preference, and then they can feel free to ignore it, right? <laughs> <laughs> As they choose. It's their prerogative. I say um, my recommendation would be full-time. Or not uh, permanent, all, or permanent, permanent, not alter. Okay. Okay. So, is and that a, a? Are we required to uh, uh, have a motion? Let's do all three. Just no, you, you, you don't have to. Yeah, it's not part of your duties as a board. But if a city commission is asking, you can issue a recommendation, but you're not required to vote on it. Okay. And I don't think we'd have to do them one at a time anyway. We can right. Resolution sixteen oh six does state. Okay. Okay, so Sherry's done. So yeah, yes. You do all three. Like yeah. Three. Showing yeah. my ignorance. <laughs> and just for a point of clarification, I think the, um, I was elect, voted, uh, whatever you- Selected. You're, yes, we'll go with that one. <laughs> um, as an alternate, but is that the case or would I actually and be advanced to a regular member? Um, what we would do is we move up in the order. And so when I do these others, I would- um, Move him up. Put him as a- Permanent. We just had a um, permanent resignation of a regular you member. Got a, you got a raise already. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it didn't take me long either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's called being drafted. Yes, <laughs> voluntold. The, yes. the other suggestion I had was I'm I'm here next year, but um, after that you don't have an attorney on the board, and I think oh, that yes, perspective right. is pretty important. So mm -hmm. um, Jared Kahn is the only attorney that I see in our list of choices. That was actually number one on my list. Okay. Great. I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> do you agree, Kathleen? I do. Does anybody know him? I don't. No. 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 Where does he practice? I don't, I don't know. I think he's retired. Wasn't okay. it uh, Pinellas County? I don't know. Let's see Jerry's. Where's Jerry's? Current employers oh, yeah. in the Pinellas County Board of... He's, a, oh. he's an assistant county attorney. Will that be a conflict for him? Yeah. Michael is a permanent. Only if we have some kind of dealing with the county. There are there are uh, situations, but we defer to staff. Really, it's not uh, sure. what we're doing is the city ordinance, not the county ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> they usually have reviewed it prior to it showing up on a, on a, this agenda. Okay. So, one more. I think I was thinking about the first one too, the one, the one first in time, but I can't get there on my screen here. Um, I know there were two local business owners, and yes. with all of the construction that's going on in the city, I personally feel it would benefit us to have someone who's got a vested interest. And who was it? I know, Shay I know Shay Gurley was one of them, and I don't know who the other one was. I actually had next on my list was Linda Pierce. Pierce. Lusinger? Yep, 
and it looks like she's the owner of Restoration and Design Professionals. Yes. So probably along the lines of what you were yes. indicating, somebody that's uh, you know, doing that development. That's another name. Deborah, page 24 of 34. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Um. I noticed that she says she resigned from all the boards to make time for the LPA. This is not the LPA, so is she on and the LPA? I know personally that she does designs all over the country. Um, so my, my only concern would be how many times would she be here mm. unless she becomes an alternate. Rebecca, can you check to make sure that that's something that she still has availability for and then she can commit to the time requirements? And is she on the LPA? Do you she's not on the LPA. She's cons uh, that's what I was looking. She's currently on the Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. Oh, good. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't speak personally, but if um, if she does do any work within the city, then it, that may preclude her from acting on applications if they are, if she has any ties to them. Uh, I know that was a question for myself personally, but a conflict. Sure. in my last couple of years, I haven't done any projects within the city, so. Yeah. I, what I do know of her, my understanding is she's done some homes downtown, goes, Purchases them, goes in, and just totally redoes them, and, and they're stunning. But is that but, a conflict? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Only if she had an application that needed a variance. <laughs> right. Or well, she was working with someone who did. Mm -hmm. Right. And if that's the case and we have a full board, then that's mm -hmm. why there's alternates. True. You know, another another one that intrigued me was this the um, actuary. Yeah, I that was my preference. I I think there might be some value there. I do too. I understand the issue of business owners, but I mean, you really have business owners here. I'm a business owner. Yes, you are. You know, and so that's sort of a built-in okay thing. Um, I mean, that's the way I was thinking about it, but. I get, I get what you're saying. I think it's just that it's already here. <laughs> you know, it's just not and maybe the primary qualification, you know. Yeah, I would have concern about um, conflicts of interest. Okay, so Linda Boo. My recommendation is Lauren Shenbein, which is the actuary. Yeah, Shen, Shenbein. Shenbein. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, is he... Uh, he or she, Lauren, is uh, I, I think a city like of Dunedin resident. He's, his business is in Clearwater. His home address is Dunedin. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep, that would be my recommendation. Any, any thoughts? I have no problem with that. Michael? Yeah, I would, I would concur with that one as well. Okay. Okay, so it is Mr. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have our permanent and two alternative. And he's yep. been a resident since 1991. He says. Oh, great. So, Even so Michael's going to turn to a permanent. Yes. And Sherry, Sherry is going to be the other permanent. permanent. Okay. The and two. the other two um, are alternate. That's good. I feel real pleased about that. It seems yeah. like a lot of diversity. I think, I think that's so very too. helpful to the rest of us. Jared and Lauren are alternates. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And just for clarification on resolution 1606. Uh, no, these are mine. Oh, Lauren, he must be a man the way it's spelled. Which is an agenda item and require it. Just for clarification. It does require it. It does. Okay. Did she say that? I'm sorry. I was talking to myself. We, we, <laughs> we are required to vote. So. 
Um, Would you like to present that, Deborah? Yeah, but I don't. Do, does somebody have the names written down? Yeah. Um, Lorne is L O R N E. Lorne. What's Sherry's last name? Oh, Nikki sent us this. This <laughs> oh is the choice. Oh. Okay, so you should have that. Oh, Nikki sent it to us. Oh, there we go. These are my notes. Okay, so, and when was it sent? May. I can, uh, could you, Rebecca, please have Nikki sent to us a guide um, for uh, a summary of the variance uh, ordinance? Could, could you resend that to the board? Mm -hmm. Especially since we have new people, uh, that would be very helpful. That would, um, you recall the, the email that she sent gave, giving us the guidance about <laughs> what our authority was, a delegation. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, yes, that. I do have that. Right here. Okay, we're ready for a motion? Please. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, make a motion that we approve uh, Lauren, or that we recommend to the, to the uh, commission, um, Lauren Shine, Scheinbein, how do you pronounce that, as um, a permanent member of the Board of Adjustment Appeal, and Sherry Schneider, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, Sherry Schneider is our permanent member, and then Lauren Scheinbein and uh, Jared Kahn as the alternate members. I'll second. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Woo. <laughs> All in favor. All in favor. Excuse me. I do that. I. <laughs> and open for discussion for public hearing as well. Yes. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. Aye. Um, well, you need to open it. Uh, open to the public. To oh, oh, I'm sorry. Is there any public uh, commentary to no. additions of <laughs> The, the members to the board. No commentary, we will close the meeting. We have a motion pending and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That was messy that we got it done. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I do it every time. I think I've seen it. I think I've seen it. I think I've seen it. I used to do uh, uh -huh. meetings. No, no, it's okay. Actually, no, I, it's I just for you today. Six o'clock. So, so the public I would have yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And I've gone yeah. till two o'clock in we the morning oh. on applications. On one no, mm -hmm. I'd be no, crazy <laughs> here. Well, I'm the one that's presenting again. Folks, <laughs> <girl. laughs> be so kind as to clean your keyboard, please. Oh, I already cleaned it before I used it. Oh, hey, that's cool. I I think the I think the question is before or after. So. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, I don't know if you met George. You met Joe, and you met no. and Jones. We have. I, I actually came and uh, tried to get you to yeah, I know, to build I know. something in, Great. in town. We're excited to have Shut us down. It's okay. <laughs> well, we do that to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, you have to be more specific. It was for doing uh, opening up another golf cart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I'm joking. I yeah. remember. We have yeah. more than one. I tried. I mean, yes. <laughs> I oh, are you good about that? Are you this year? <laughs> Uh, next year. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm here till the end of next year. End of 2020. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I deal with the you know, critical root zones and, and all that stuff on a regular basis. And yeah. Thanks, John. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. You guys yeah. have a Thanksgiving. Yes, Thanks, you, you too. too. Do we have anything for December? Do you know? Uh, not yet. Okay. okay. Let's leave. We have a reprieve. At this point, good. Because, <laughs> you know, they would have had to have their stuff. Right, sure. All right. Yeah. Everyone Thank have you. wonderful holidays. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm clean. Just Thank for the relationship with me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, here's my mask that I don't wear, but I do carry. That's right. I carry one, but only wear it. Thanks, my Good to meet you. Thank you. Nice Welcome. to meet you as well. Welcome. Because <laughs> I figure everybody's sick in the drugstore. Yeah, probably. You're probably right.
One stop real quick. Carolina, happy Thanksgiving. Are there any cases? Do you know? I don't, for for next VAA, month? I don't have any. And I don't know about code either. Oh, maybe yeah. we'll see. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll have a, a nice December. <laughs> I see you all the days if I don't see you. Yes, yeah. you as well. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It was a long, 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 long year. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh my God, holidays? It's been a long year. You got that. Yeah. That's 100%. Okay. That's I thought, uh, what I didn't understand. I mean, and then he was gone when I looked up, and I was Me like, too. Oh, "Okay." He lives in Maine. That's what I was. Thinking. Right. Um, not this week, but um, right after Thanksgiving, okay. not Tuesday because I have a work session, but Monday and Wednesday because my daughter, my, all my, my family will still be here. That's great. I'm leaving three weeks tomorrow. Oh. Oh, my gosh. You know, I hate correcting when I, but it was just kind of like, <laughs> you feel bad like you're that know-it-all. But I didn't want them not to vote because that's exactly what Resolution 1606 says they have to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to speak up too because they were saying, I know there's another businessman there, but They never considered it. They didn't consider it, no. But then they changed their, their attitude about a business owner. They're like, well, we're all business owners. I'm like, that's not really true. Yeah. Just let them go. Right. I like the art in here. Mm -hmm. So do I. I do, too. I know. The pugs are great.
Yeah.